Here is a small sampling of some of the body commentary I receive on a day-to-day -day basis via the World Wide Web. She looks like a warthog to me. Hashtag truth. Lena Dunham, hence her last name equals Dun Ham equals cooked pig. Lena Dunham looks like the type of person who likes to fart in her hand and smell it. I want Lena Dunham's fat ass dead. Lena Dunham looks like a toe. Disgusting, quivering mass of horror is the best description of Lena Dunham I've ever heard. Lena Dunham does have a horrible body. Hate it every time she had her ugly naked ass body on girls. Hashtag Lena Dunham, Jesus Christ, what a fat, ugly bitch, black. Those last few tweets actually just came from this morning before I even woke up. And one of the ones I didn't read you actually caused me to contact a highly paid security professional. So congratulations to me. <laughs> are you pleased? One of the worst thing I was like, are these bad enough? I'm sorry, no, you can do I loved it. I didn't mind. It was my idea. It may seem odd to say that reading these tweets doesn't really hurt me, but it doesn't. I view it more as an anthropological study, less about one woman, me, and more about women, us. I know that these aren't healthy to read. I know that they're not expanding my mind. That's why I don't check my own Twitter anymore. But when I have to look at them, I feel this kind of hollow, empty curiosity. That being said, some of these details are so creative and so observant that they can't help but impress you. I mean, I do look like a toe. I've had so much more than a good time. It's meant so much more to me. But I don't know if I'll ever fit inside who you want me to be. Welcome to Women of the Hour. I'm Lena Dunham, and I am a delicate flower. Today we're going to be talking about bodies, our relationships to our bodies as women. And let's start with something a little more uplifting than the tweets that I got today. And say, I'm A.D. Bryant, and I'm a full-blown size bitch. <laughs> Lena and I, recently on a trip together, were sharing a steak as a snack, basically. And we were talking about how, like, it's probably insane to have, like, a steak for a snack, but that is cool, that's who we are, snack steak. We were talking about what it's like to kind of, um navigate like the Hollywood systems. Ew, who am I to say Hollywood systems? But like kind of, you know, show business and not be like a tiny little teeny little teensy feather woman. And just kind of what our experience is for like addressing for events. And I was telling her that basically I sometimes call myself a size bitch, which basically <laughs> to me means sorry to be a bitch, but I'm not going to apologize for my size, you know, and that I'm not a uh, I'm not wrong for having the body that I do. I still deserve to be dressed cool, or I still deserve to feel as glamorous or as uh, Hollywood cool as anyone else. It's interesting because I feel like a lot of times when I'm like reading scripts or something that maybe someone sent to me and they're like, we're thinking of you for this, it ends up being like, kind of like a low status, nervous, kind of like hungry woman. <laughs> Which, I get it. That is kind of what I am. I'm, I mean, not that I'm low status, but I'm a nervous, hungry woman. And so, yes, that's a type that I can play. And so I wonder sometimes if there is sort of like a pigeonhole that you're sort of, uh, people try to like kind of put you in just because you have some quality of otherness. In a lot of ways, I think of my otherness as like my greatest strength. It's what make, makes me different. It's part of the reason I can play a lot of the roles that I get to play. But... Of course, it, it has its, like, you know, its other sides where maybe it does keep me from playing the romantic lead in some kind of, like, traditional rom-com. But at the same time, guess what? I don't want to fucking do a rom-com, so who fucking cares? Ooh, can I cuss on this? I'm being bad. <laughs> I remember once when I was in Chicago, I was performing and I was doing this very small show and afterwards a woman came up to me from the crowd and she was like a bigger gal and she was like, you are so beautiful. Do not let the producers tell you, you ever have to change. Just don't let the producers. And I was like, oh my God, who are these terrifying mystery producers who are like, you've got to lose the weight, bitch. 
Um, but it's never happened, you know? Like, I never have had a producer pull me aside and tell me, like, ooh, we need to slim you down or something. And it's probably good, because if they did, I would immediately just, like, headbutt them, so. It's not a bad thing for me to be who I am. <laughs> it's actually a good thing. A.D. Bryant is a friend who turns my heart into sweet tarts and glitter. See her on SNL, this coming season of Girls, and wherever there is a dog with a smashed-in face. And let's just say you do not want to be on the receiving end of an A.D. Bryant headbutt. Hair is so much more than just that weird string of cellular matter that sits atop our heads and covers up our crotches. Our relationship to our hair is a lifelong, ever-changing journey of identity. And assumptions, bad advice, frustration, like being constantly told we're supposed to tame our frizz. If the sun ever catches the back of your head and you have frizz, there is nothing more beautiful in this world. I cannot imagine something prettier than just like a lit halo of like, like strands in dialogue around someone's brain. It just like looks like your actual thoughts like floating around your head. It's so amazing. So if you tame your frizz, like that's just never gonna be possible, that shot. That's the writer Catherine Bernard who only has great things to say. BuzzFeed producer Eleanor Kagan invited some people into the studio to share their hair journeys and she asked the timeless question, are we our hair? Let's begin with Hana. My name is Hannah Georges. My hair is about a bit past, like, shoulder length. Super tightly curled, very kinky, very, very thick. When I have my afro out, everybody has something to say. Like, everything from, like, I'm going to make, like, a smart remark about, like, Angela Davis, or, like, I'm going to, you know, like, those kinds of remarks, or, like, how did you get it that way? I'm like, I'm black. <laughs> it's like, that's all. I washed it. I let it dry, <laughs> um, combed it, you know, um, to like, how do you wash it? Like all these sorts of things that are like often benign, but just exhausting. I went to school in New Hampshire and I went to where there are just not a lot of black people. I went to a grocery store um, with some friends and a young black girl, I'll never forget this, a like six year old maybe, young black girl kind of ran up to me and pulled on her, um, her aunt's sweater and she said, auntie, um, her hair looks like mine. And it was one of those things where I was like, oh, my God, this little girl does not see people with natural hair ever. She lives in New Hampshire. Her family is, you know, she's in an adopted family. Like, she just doesn't have this representation. And it's, like, actually very meaningful. And so, you know, I had a conversation with her aunt about what it means and, like, how to help her take care of it and all these things. Because I, I didn't grow up seeing, like, natural-haired women as a little girl. Um, and so I didn't really think about what it looked like to be, like, old and, like, professional or, like, older and, like, stylish or all these things um, in a way that, like, I think that young girls have a little bit more access to now. But it still feels important. And I think the flip side of that is reminding myself that I am still also an individual human being that doesn't have to carry, like, the weight of representation and race at all moments. Um, but I do try to be intentional about that when I can. The best feeling, actually, is when you, like, see another woman with natural hair and you, like, look at her hair and then you look at her and you're like, am I going to compliment her? And then you open your mouth to compliment her and at the exact same time, she opens her mouth to say she likes your hair. And there, there's a way that, like, other natural hair, other black women validate each other that, like, nobody else can do. It's like, I, like, I know that twist out took a long time. You know, I know that, like, you're, you're, there's, like, four Shea Moisture products in there. But whatever you're doing, it's working and I see you. That feeling is, like, top 10, like, black girl feelings of all time. Like, I saw a group, um, <laughs> I walked past a group of maybe, like, 10 black women with, like, natural hair and, like, braids and, like, afros and, like, just, like, beautiful hair. And I walked past and I was literally, like, my eyes, like, lit up. I was so excited. I walked past them. I was like, oh, my God, you guys are beautiful. Like, something. Um, and so I complimented them and walked past. And they were all taking a picture. And they were like, wait, wait, no, no, come back. Like, get in the picture. <laughs> And so Aww. I was just in this picture on 34th Street, and I have no idea where that picture went, but it was just that, like, I don't know, it feels almost ethereal. Um, it feels like there's something that we're that we're sharing here that I don't know how to communicate to other people in, in a way that quite expresses it. So you have India Ari, who says, I am not my hair. You have Lady Gaga, who says, I am my hair. Hana? Yes. Are you your hair? Yeah, I think I'm my hair. My hair is also part of the reason that I became politicized around blackness in the certain ways that I have. Um, and so 
I think that I grab like I think that I gravitated toward understandings of like visual and like phenotypic blackness in the in the U.S. Partly because my hair is super tightly curled. Being invested in like black liberation struggles and blackness is something that's super central to how I think of myself. And so I think for better or for worse, I am my hair. Um, my hair is like dynamic and shifting and does what it wants and also what I want it to. Um, and so it feels like a fair thing to say. <laughs> Hannah Georges is a writer who covers the intersection of pop culture, race, class, and gender. We are here at Women of the Hour. We're talking to musician Mindy Lind, who... Hi, Mindy. Hi. Mindy sings and plays piano with the band Inley. She's coming at us from Seattle, and I actually first met Mindy when I was on my book tour for Not That Kind of Girl, and we had people submit videos as opening talent, and Mindy submitted a video of herself singing, and it fucking rocked my world. She has a haunting voice and an incredible mind. And then there's also a detail about Mindy, which is that she has no legs and rides around on a skateboard. (laughs) I identify as being a crip. I sometimes refer to those characterizations as crip culture. That particular phrase, crip, that's short for cripple. Yeah. You've told me before that that's an identity that kind of challenges the notion of disability, one that can mean edgy and complex and sexual and creative. So I want to start by asking you about that. How does your identity within crip culture intersect with your creative expression as a musician? For me, disability has always sort of been seen as a kind of a lack coming at me that like sort of I don't have any legs. But identity wise, I've sort of experienced disability or crip life as opportunity as that this world wasn't made for me. So I get to adapt to it. And that is a creative act every single day. So it came time for me to start making music. It was coming out of that, not necessarily directly in that I like seeing about having no legs <laughs> as much as that I've always um, been an adapting person, a really creative person, and that's come directly out of living in a world that really wasn't set up for me. You were born with no legs, right? Yes. There's never been a different way for you of experiencing the world. Right. Except for that time when I was younger and they tried to make me wear prosthetics. (laughs) I was totally in it for the Mary Janes. That's amazing. (laughs) And then I tried them on and I was like, these are awful and they don't feel good and you know I don't really feel like myself and it's really cool to see at the tops of the counters and like I got to go roller skating one time but uh, other than that I was super over it really quickly you just wanted to have some clueless shoes and after that you were done that's exactly right that's exactly right I liked going into the shoe store too and being <laughs> with my brother and we didn't have the legs at the time and I remember, like, let's go shopping. Like, they're going to be here soon. we got to get them and going into the shoe store without legs. And be like, do you have my size? You strike me as a really political person. You're so clearly a feminist and you have a set of ideals that you're fighting for. How does your sort of feminism and your crip life, as you call it, how do those things intersect for you and what do they mean in relation to each other? Both roles are things that I find the um, this like sort of power and oppression from, you know, I treat them with a boldness. I really don't tend to, to want to act like these traditional roles of what it is to be a woman nor a traditional role of what it is to like be a person who uses a wheelchair. I'm really resistant to both of those. And then there's this other tricky stuff like the sort of cliches of uh, – being a woman without legs, I think one of those would be that I'm really, really strong. (laughs) And uh, while I want to be resistant to that and feel feminine or, you know, whatever, I think that there's probably truth to every stereotype, as they say, and uh, that I have sort of claimed some of that strength for my own. Well, it's really amazing when we were in Seattle and we and you you know, opened the the reading I was doing that night and you came on stage with your skateboard and it was like, for a moment, that's what rocked people. And then you got behind the piano and that's what rocked people. And seeing you mm. be so in control of your own representation, mm-hmm. I think gave everybody full body chills because you were the owner completely of your own image. And I had kind of never seen a woman take that kind of ownership and kind of almost manipulate this space around her in that way. And it was really mind blowing. I love that. I feel like you just named it. That's so good. (laughs) And I want to know, I mean, here's the thing is like, yes, you live in Seattle. You're surrounded by liberal people. There's so much respect for your music. But you must also get a lot of really stupid fucking questions. And I wonder Mm -hmm. whether you have to do a lot of educating on a daily basis. And does that get tiring? 
Yeah, I mean, on a good day when I feel well supported and really engaged and not isolated and like my hair looks fabulous, it's my power. It is a real kind of like what you were just describing, a real crip confidence that is like unique and special and I don't have to dye my hair a weird color. Like I am kind of weird and interesting and I get off on it. And then on a bad day when I don't feel so well supported and um, I'm just not doing so good I can tend to feel like a clown and I really fucking hate it so I think it depends on what day it is or how I'm feeling or what sort of reaction I'm getting I'd say though in general I um you know I get the most fascinating questions from kids and I tend to answer them really practically because I don't want to make myself extraterrestrial to them so some examples of questions from kids are like they're all very practical. They're like, if you don't have any legs, then how do you even brush your teeth? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then with the adults, and this is why I'm sort of so up on crip culture, so up on images in the media, because I, I feel like I know what images are being portrayed based on the responses that get thrown at me. These what I call crip cat calls, which get said to me basically every time I go outside. So they can really vary from like the other day when I went into one of those really awesome legal weed stores here in Seattle and I was on a skateboard and I come in and the woman who's like there to greet you is like oh, really traumatized by my impairment. And she's like, oh my God, are you okay? Are you hurt? Like really traumatized. And I get angry. I get really angry. Like, and what I really w want to do is be sarcastic and annoying. Like, I just lost my legs in the parking lot <laughs> and it's a bloody mess out there and I need your help. You know, like I want to be like, yeah, that's what hurt looks like versus like, I'm just coming in here and I'm shorter than you. There's no trauma around yeah. that. And then some really funny stuff like that one time I went to a bar and this guy came up to me all suave and cool and was all like, I don't really care that you have no legs. I totally want to finger fuck you in the bathroom right now. <laughs> Stuff like that, where people like think they're saying the right edgy thing. And it's like, mm, no. I was thinking that there would probably be a lot of men particularly who like fetishized it and talked to you in a grotesque way. Like, I wonder what kind of influence it has on like dating, particularly the beginning, particularly meeting people. Like, is that a real test, how people react and how they engage? For sure. And it's funny that you said at the beginning, because I actually think that that's really the, the charm piece right there is that like when and I say men because I'm like, you know, I date men. So I think when men usually meet me, they are really excited by their attraction to me. That part of it's really exciting to me, too. You know, like you're really I see that I, I see that newness, that excitement. And I I super duper get off on it. And then in a, a lot of ways, it can be super confusing because what's the difference between that and like, you know, real attraction and the real complexities of dating. You don't want to feel like a fetish object for someone. Right. Or and when I do, because I think it's part of that energy can be really powerful. I want to know that like when the excitement wears off that like I'm still interesting and that we get to still date and spend time together. So yeah, that it goes beyond that, I think is the really confusing part. Most of the people listening to this podcast, I'm going to guess, are going to be radical women who care about like advancing causes of identity. Hopefully there'll be a couple mm. 65 year old male weirdos in there too. <laughs> but I wonder if there's something you want to say to those people, like if there's a way that like we can be supportive, engaged, down for the cause without fetishizing it. Like what do you, what do you want from us? Well, I mean, I think that disability rights right now really looks like disability justice. It's such a wide reaching section of the population covering all cultures. So it's not really a question of if we're going to show up. It's really more like when. Yeah. So to think of more culturally integrative ways that we can include folks with disabilities so that when we show up and this goes beyond bathroom stalls, beyond all that ADA stuff, it's like, actually, when I get into a bathroom and I'm with my friends at a bar, I'd really like to be able to check my eyeliner in the bathroom mirror. And I feel like that's not something that folks are going to think about unless they spend some time with me. And so because you can't really disregard people whose stories you know, I think that's what we can do right now is to be sharing more stories. To be, And I think that people are eager about them. Every single time I go outside, people are eager to know about me. Yeah. So to be inclusive of that is the best we can do right now for sure and that's also because you're the most charming living person in the world that's another that's another <laughs> aspect 
we're going to play some of your music. And there's a beautiful song that you sent me that you wrote recently. And I wondered if you wanted to give it a little intro. Okay. Well, this song, um, I just did a lot of thinking of sort of like life as a life as a woman and what it is to be a girl. And I noticed I do spend some of my time being a recluse and a little bit of a reckless. So, uh, so this is what that song is about. And I hope you guys like it. Keeping Amazing Mindy Lind for writing that song just for this show. Are you ready for some advice from June Squibb and Emma Stone? Ooh. <laughs> Good question. Two women who, despite an age difference of almost 60 years, are on the same page sass wise. No one is going to fuck with June Squibb. They don't. Remember the theme this week is our relationships to our bodies. We asked BuzzFeed readers to send their questions, and send them they did. How do I feel more confident without makeup on? Well, when I first started wearing makeup, I put it pretty much all over my face in thick layers. And that's how I felt good. And then now, well, Lena can see me, I'm wearing, a, I'm still wearing my makeup from last night. So maybe I, I feel more comfortable with makeup on too. I, I think that when you're young and go through, say, an acne problem or something like that, where you're not sure of your your looks because of this that that colors you know how you feel even when you get older but I think many I had some problems like that I've struggled with acne for the past 10 years so my whole thing is having skin issues and I always get really down about my skin when it gets bad because whenever I'm stressed or I don't sleep enough it just goes crazy on my face and I feel like everyone can see what I'm feeling through my crazy breakouts so um, I'm in a similar struggle about feeling, feeling confident with my uh, skin just as it is. Everybody now, I mean, every time I, I, I get makeup put on by a makeup woman now, or, or man, they always say, oh, my God, your skin's so wonderful. And, and I just keep going, oh, my God, remember how the trouble I had when I was a teenager. So I think that, that that's reality. That, that, that is a reality in terms of going without. And then otherwise, I think you just look at yourself and say, hell, I look wonderful, <laughs> and that's it. I have a lot of friends that wear absolutely no makeup and just feel great about that. So I guess it's just, you know, to each her own. Yeah, because maybe it's that you can feel confident with makeup off or you can feel confident with makeup on, and either one's an okay choice. Either one's an okay choice. That was Emma Stone and June Squibb, our nation's preeminent advice gurus. For those of you who don't know, here are the facts. The life expectancy for a trans woman of color is 35. According to the National Coalition of Anti-Violence, trans people are seven times more likely to experience physical violence when interacting with police compared to cisgender survivors and victims. So in short, you have to learn how to survive. When you're a young person who also happens to be trans, you carry the weight of navigating your gender identity, plus dealing with safety, on top of the usual teenage fare, crushes, zits, homework, social hierarchies. My sibling Grace Dunham asked former teenage girl and current badass adult human woman Janet Mock about her childhood and her path to becoming one of the leading writers, thinkers, and trans activists of our time. I wanted to ask you, Janet, when you were a, a young woman, when you were a teenage girl, what did you think your life was going to look like? Oh my God, what did I think my life was going to look like? <laughs> Probably I would, I would say something at the time I imagined myself to be like the second coming of, you know, um, Claire Danes' character in My So-Called Life. I saw myself as very um, wistful and angsty and very romantic. And, <laughs> and then I think that graduated to you know, Felicity in New York mm -hmm. City and being a college student and like thinking about what it would be like to have like a group of friends who are kind of like minded and um, being able to dream about holding hands with a boy. I think that probably one of the most important things that I wanted at that time was I would say would be, I guess, um, reciprocal love. Mm -hmm. 
How has writing and and having people really look to your voice, how has that affected your feeling of safety in the world? I do feel there's a sense of, you know, now the things that I write and the things that I say or the things that I tweet are seen as shaping and shifting conversations. And on the one hand, I love that influence. Um, But at the same time, I am worried by it because we can often only name a couple names and we use that as the state of consciousness and record when I know there are many voices who are not heard. It was like, I'm the basic model of like a transsexual person's experience, right? I went from being perceived as a little boy and growing up as a little boy child and who was very like feminine and would be labeled a sissy. And then I transitioned to like this binary, you know, woman, you know, this trans woman of color, like mixed race, right? But I don't know what it means to be a trans man, a trans man of color. I can talk about the resonant pieces that I think may overlap, but not necessarily, you know, know what, what that experience is. And so I think that it, it it is hard. It's hard having my work leave the safety of my little social justice activist friends and circles. Um, and so oftentimes I know that I am people's entryway into understanding the trends experience. <laughs> I think there's so much pressure on us, particularly on young people, this idea of finding our strength from within. And I think, of course, we do have to find a lot of strength from within. But I've I've always felt like the idea that that only comes from inside you kind of distracts from how essential our relationships, our friendships, our love relationships, our sexual relationships are to feeling like we're the versions of ourselves that that we want to be. Yeah. And then I love that you talk about the different facets of love, right? There's romantic partnership and sex and desire. And then there's like, I I think about how I came into identity and largely it came out of community of like sisterhood. Mm. I think about my best friend, Wendy, who I grew up with. She helped me be loud. She helped me be quote unquote flamboyant. And she helped me kind of have the audacity to like be myself. And she's another trans girl that I met in the seventh grade. We're both 12 years old. And she clocked me and she was just like, I know you're trans. Why are you pretending that you're not a girl? Like, let's <laughs> let's just go ahead and do this. And we were sewing up hip pads from shoulder pads out of, you know, um, thrift stores and, you know, figuring out what identity was for us and what girlhood and womanhood was for us. Sewing shoulder pads into hip pads. That's activism, right? Yeah. And we did not buy the shoulder pads. We would steal them. We would cut them out in the dressing room. We would cut them out of the shoulders and put them into our backpacks and then return the blazers onto the thing and then go and like sew them up together in like a sister knitting circle and create our bodies in a sense so that we could be more, you know, we could pass. And passing was a sense of like being able to walk in the street without being checked and yelled at and misgendered and all of the things. And so all those things are, yeah, they're all forms of self actualization, of course, but also activism and sisterhood, which is so powerful. One of the biggest lessons that my very close friend and mentor, Raina Gossett, has taught me is that just that friendship in and of itself, just that love is radical. Yeah, none of us come up alone, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that the work is improving and making sure that I am not the last. And so how do you bring other people in? How do you reach back and keep that door open for other people to come in? For girls who are younger than me, who are dealing with a whole different range of issues because of the internet, because of the higher hyper visibility of trans women in media, how is this affecting them knowing that you know, there's Caitlin and Laverne mm-hmm. and me and Carmen and Isis and Gina and all of these different women doing amazing things. Like, how is this affecting them? Well, how do you think it affects young women, young black women, young women of the trans experience to look at magazines and at the TV and see heroes? How do you think that affects them? I think on the one hand, I'm sure it fills these girls with possibility and hope that they can do what they want. But I think at the same time, they also know that some of it's luck. Mm. The great irony of my success is that it deludes people into believing that my level of success and my experience is possible for every trans girl of color who's growing up right now. And the reality is it's not. So I wanted to ask you one last question. And I'm sure that there's infinite answers to both of these, but I'm really curious what you have to say. What's something 
in the world that you feel really angry about right now? And what's something in the world that you feel really hopeful about? I think the answer would be the same for both. So what makes me excited in the world right now is the visibility of Black people. I think right now in our culture, in our movements, in you know TV and movies and books and Black Twitter, like that excites me to have this presence that's there. And at the same time, I'm also angry by it because I'm seeing already the narrative of being like, well, it seems like we have too many right now. And, you know, all lives should matter. And kind of this counter narrative that that is speaking to the existence of people of color holding their own space. And sometimes, you know, with my own experience, there's this pressure to be like, well, maybe you shouldn't talk about blackness too much because it's going to make it may turn people off. Um, and so like, like, despite the anger and rage I feel from people saying that don't say that, I need to say it. And that makes me feel optimistic is like centering blackness and womanhood and transness in the work that I do. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you for all the work you have done. Thank you for the balancing act you do. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks so much, Grace. That was Janet Mock, my idol, and Grace Dunham, who I've known since childhood. Janet recently slept over at my house, smells very good, and is welcome back anytime. My name is Meredith Toulousin, and my hair is blonde and straight. Right now, part of it is shaved. It's sort of in a top, a long top knot. You know, it's shaved all around, but then when it's down, because of the fact that my hair, I have a lot of it, um, people actually don't really know that it's shaved in the back, and I kind of like that. So I grew up in a rural part of the Philippines. I'm albino. When I was growing up, I grew up in an area where there were literally no foreigners. And so I was literally the only blonde person around. And my grandfather was a politician and he, you know, and like some of the districts that he represented were remote. So he would like bring me to those districts and put me in the middle of like some public area. And then people would start coming out you know, and and being like, oh, look, you know, like there was that blind person. And, you know, and then he would like make his speech, you know, so there's there's this like whole, um, you know, and so I think that like from a very early age, I was taught to value my hair. There was this ABBA song called Thank You for the Music. And like, there's this line in it where it says, you know, like, I've been so lucky, I was the girl with golden hair. And I remember that as a kid, just being like, oh, you know, like, I have golden hair, you know, and that was kind of like one of the very, very early times when I clearly remember identifying with a woman. Like, I remember how, like, the female singers in the, sh- in the band were blonde, and I was blonde. You know, my body hair is also blonde, and body hair is a really significant issue in the trans community because hair is one of the major secondary sex characteristics. So a lot of trans women struggle being read and perceived as female because of the fact that they have an excess of dark hair. Whereas, like, for me, like, I just put on a dress and people just assume that I, I was female. It's part of my privilege, and it's a privilege that I, you know, that I try to recognize and own up to. I like the sort of flexibility of my self-expression. There are times when I braid it, but then sometimes I would do like a fancy French braid, and and that looks much more genderqueer, you know, because it's like, it emphasizes kind of like really, really strong polar opposites of the binary of having something like completely shaved on the one hand but very ornate on the other. I had been really struggling with trying to communicate that even though I'm a post-transition transgender woman, I still feel sort of um, hampered by the gender system in general. And I have a lot of issues being identified as a woman, 
you know, without my transgender history. You know, yes, like, there are dangers to being identified as trans, but if we weren't discriminated against, you know, I feel like it's a really important part of who I am and it's something that I want to communicate. And so I kind of wanted a hairstyle that would communicate the ways in which I'm not completely satisfied with the gender system. But at the same time, I also kind of really like my hair, and I actually really like having long hair. Okay, so here's the moment I ask, Meredith, are you your hair? I am, and I am not my hair. (laughs) I think that my hair has not necessarily determined, but definitely like significantly affected large parts of my life, you know, that is undoubtedly the case. And I have an ongoing and important relationship to it, but I do try to not let it define me. Meredith Toulousen covers LGBT issues for BuzzFeed and will be an ABBA fan forever. I'm so excited to talk to Emily Ratajkowski, actor, model, feminist, known to some as the Girl from the Blurred Lines video, Here we discuss just how blurry the lines can get, I'm very sorry, in the modeling industry, Hollywood, and the world at large when a young woman attempts to control her own narrative. I honestly wanted to know what it's like to be cast in things based on what your body looks like, which hasn't happened to me save for one offer to play a very hungry juror. So here Emily talks about the experiences and people, shout out to awesome moms, that have influenced her and made it possible for her to navigate a world obsessed with subjugating female bodies. So we've been done a lot of communicating, but it's our first time meeting. Yeah, this is a big deal. It was like the blind date with a person that you already know you want to have a relationship with. That's exactly how I <laughs> felt. No, I was really a fan from the beginning because I felt like after Blurred Lines came out and you were immediately catapulted into this position of being like not only a face that was known to everybody, but the face of something that had so much controversy surrounding it. You refused to just sort of like be a silent pawn in the entire dialogue and that you made it so clear so quickly that you had a voice and that you stood for something and that you were like a woman with a perspective. And that was really exciting to see. And I feel like you've continued that through this, the trajectory of your career thus far. And I was wondering if you could like sort of take us back to the beginning Mm -hmm. and what it was like when that entire moment happened. Yeah, it was really interesting because I think that it was almost an afterthought, people asking me what I had to say about the video. I think it was really an important moment for me to sort of stand up and say, oh, you want to ask me about what it means, you know, to be a sexual woman in this industry or in this video? I've got lots of things to say about that. Thanks for the opportunity. And um, yeah, it it was interesting to see how controversial saying anything like that still is. I mean, paraphrase for us, like, what your response was when people would say to you, how do you feel about this video? How do you feel about the controversy around the video? Basically, you know, I talk about the process of the video, which I think is really important. And not a lot of people know that um, the director of the video was female, Diane Martell. I'm a huge fan of her. Yeah, she's a really smart lady. And had you decided to do it after talking to Diane and understanding her vision for it? Yes. So I had turned it down. And then Diane um, sent an email to my agent and said, like, have her come in. I really want to talk to her. And it just sort of... Um, I knew the DP, Olivia Malone, also, who shot the whole thing. It's amazing and, there was a female DP. Yes. And it's she rad. really shoots women. Like, she actually had shot me topless before, and it was, like, the prettiest, the prettiest pictures I've ever seen. That's um, Like, amazing. shadows of flowers, like, on my body. So I just felt really trusting of her. And then also, um, you know, Diane's a smart woman and knew exactly what she was doing with the video. And at that point, you had been modeling for how long? Um, you know, I always tell people I started I signed with Ford when I was 14. So for a very long time. But that being said, I went to a public high school. Um, it was like instead of working at a coffee shop or yeah. in retail, <laughs> I yeah. would drive up to L.A. once a month and do I did a Nickelodeon show or I do, a yeah. you know, Nordstrom's or Forever 21 or something like that. So even though it was a part of, um, you know, how I paid for a little bit of college and paid for like lunches in high school. Um, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't what I really identified with. I never was a model in my mind. When you originally said no to the video, it was part of that. Like, had you in that period from get, cause like, getting signed as a 14 year old girl must be really complicated because you're not really yet a fully sexual being. No. But you're being invited into an industry that is sort of predicated on selling the erotic female image. Absolutely. So had you had experiences in the period from like 14 to say 20 where you were like, 
I know how this can go wrong and I don't want to be put in another situation like this. You know, I think it started even before I was modeling. I developed really young and I kind of looked like what I look like now at 11 or 12. Um, So before I understood what sex was, I was being looked at by men, which was a really weird experience. And um, I basically had a really great mom um, who celebrated my sexuality and made it very clear that I was not to be embarrassed or that anything I wore was something I should feel bad about. Well, because she made it clear that it's like you can wear whatever you want because the illness lies with the people who are sexualizing you and the people who are go- who are going to act as though that is like a doorway to abuse you. The illness isn't like with you and your body and your desire to whatever show a strip of stomach or whatever it is that fucking 13 year old girls want to do. 100%. And she just really made that clear to me from the get go. So I think, you know, throughout my life, probably very similar to a lot of young women, you try to understand your sexuality um, and you make mistakes. And I think that you know as a model there were definitely moments where I was I look back and I think like that photographer was totally inappropriate and creepy but honestly I probably had more experiences with that with like my education than even in the industry which is funny so interesting Um, because I think there's a political correctness there's a you know people are trying to be careful because the modeling you know is so associated with the objectification of young women and especially in the last few years there have been so many people who have been called out for like Kind, kinds of behavior that is really uncomfortable, invasive, and illegal. Yeah. And so at this point, people are wanting to say, like, no, this is a clean industry. This isn't a place where women are being I mean, the other abused. thing that, you know, really helps, and that's why I really want to talk about this stuff so much, so that it might reach young women's ears. And I'm talking, like, beginning of puberty, because we know now that you are sort of thrown into sex so early now that that's not even like hitting puberty is like nothing you know you're already watching videos of whatever um so uh the internet is a crazy place so to me it's what really helped in all these situations whether it be with my teachers or with photographers or agents was just being a confident young person a young woman and i think that that's something i learned really early on from having a mom that like i explained was always you know telling me not to apologize and i think that in some way it protected me because it throws people off so much um and even now i mean you know i go into producers offices you come in and you are mature you're smart and and you scare the living shit out of these men. That's and I so think that that's the ultimate power that you can uh, any young young woman really holds. Um, and I think it's just a matter of helping young women tap into that rather than apologize for it. That is so beautifully put that I have chills all over my body. I mean, it's Good. so, it's <laughs> incredible. Because that is a fact, which is like, people are such assholes mm. about their expectations of young women and like I'm not a model I didn't come into this industry being like sexualized really in a traditional way Mm -hmm. and I still dealt with men who acted shocked that I had any boundaries because I would deal with this thing which was different where guys would be like you make movies about sex so in our general meeting I'm going to tell you how much I hate fucking my wife and how lonely I am and like 16 um, weird things I did in uh, West Hollywood last week and I would be like what am I, what do you think you're doing? But that's so interesting because I think it actually goes back to the video or about nudity in general with women. No one understands that there's a difference about owning and exploring sexuality in an empowering way or the objectification. So those guys see that you've done a lot of like sex scenes or that your show yeah. deals with young women and their sexuality and they assume that, that you can, they can tell you their dirty fantasies. As you're starting to act more, like, what are you looking for in roles and how are you thinking about your job as a female actor and vis-a-vis your politics and vis-a-vis all of these really strong, important beliefs you have? Yeah, so there's one one way in which you have to handle yourself in the industry, um, which is filled with men and is a complete boys club. And then there's sort of the artistic decisions you make when you choose a character or how you decide to portray a character that you've been cast as um, and you've been asked to take on a role. So for me, it's interesting. I mean, I start at both movies that I'm really, you know, have uh, was an actor in, um, Gone Girl and in We Are Your Friends. I'm sort of the object of affection of these male characters and I'm totally seen through their eyes. But I also think that they're dynamic, interesting women. And just because they're being shot and seen that way doesn't mean that that's all that they are. 
I think that you can, as an actor, bring many levels to those ideas of girls, right? Like you have this idea of what a woman, you know, she's the smart girl, she's the nerdy girl. These are all characters that have probably been written by men. But I think as an artist, you can bring you know, a life to them. And I hope that young actresses or older actresses can bring many levels so that when a woman woman watch movies that are basically male centric, they can relate to the female character despite the lack of writing. Um, And I also think it's, you know, kind of what I did with blurred lines or what I do when I do like a weird sexy photo shoot. I want to talk about why I'm doing that and my intentions and like how I take ownership of those things. And so when someone asks me like, oh, well, how does it feel to be scantily clad? I have a complex answer um, that brings up issues that I hope people relate to. Yeah. And it's I mean, I relate to them and people don't ask me to be scantily clad that often they should but you're so nice actually i was recently asked i was like i can't do that but it's because they wanted me to have a beard at the same time wow and you i was like, might be getting worse scripts than i am it's like i was like it's too complicated <sighs> but the question i wanted to ask you because i think this is one that's really important for young women but women everywhere is like how does your intuition come into all of this like do you when you read when you get an offer or when you read a script like is it very intellectual for you or do you have like a, a true feeling like deep in your bones like an intuitive sense that lets you know what is and isn't safe for you and how do you interact with that I do feel like I have an innate understanding of what's okay and what's not for me but that intuition has been informed by great friends great female friends a great mother through my own experiences and mistakes and um you know I I think that there's two parts to that Emily, we really, we meaning me, because I like to pretend that I'm not the only person talking here. We're so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful to be asked to be here. It makes me so happy. My name is Rachel Fleet. I lost all of the hair on my body when I was a year and a half, so I'm a bald lady. I have um, alopecia universalis, so that means that I am universally without hair. It's an autoimmune sort of situation in which like, my brain sends a message like 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that hair is harmful. People don't really know what alopecia is. They mostly think I have cancer or I shaved my head. I remember being a kid and like in third grade we learned about mammals and reptiles and amphibians and I remember sitting in class and the teacher was like mammals are warm-blooded animals that have hair and then I went home that day and I asked my mother or father one of them or both of them I was like am I a mammal like I thought maybe (laughs) I wasn't a mammal because I had no hair I wore a wig from age four until 18 Every year I had like a different wig that was like with the times. So like 85 was a mullet, 86 was a mushroom cut. <laughs> Very on, on trend. Yeah, I was always on trend. I had a perm in 1990. I have saved a lot of money on haircuts, but I also say like all of the money that I saved on haircuts, I put towards like six and a half years of psychoanalysis to talk about my lack of hair. <laughs> When I started to do theater in high school, like there was like these boys that were like already saying that they were gay. I feel like I came out, you know, like I identify 100% with the coming out experience. They were like, I'm gay. And I was like, I'm bald. And I took off my wig. And for the first time I was told by like my best friend, Andrew, he was like, you're beautiful. And like, don't ever wear that wig. No one had ever said that to me. I can't go undercover. And so it's all about being there for the world. And it's a very vulnerable position to be in. One of the funniest things or the most ironic things is this like sort of cat call ish situation that happens on the street with people who tell me that I have a nice haircut. And I've actually like have never had a haircut in my entire life. <laughs> And it's just like this weird, like ironic thing. And like, depending on like my sort of like, I guess you could call it my spiritual fitness. Like if I'm in a good place and I'm like, I love the world and namaste, I'm like, thank you. 
I send you light and love. But other times I'm like, it's not a haircut. <laughs> I also um, have been called sir. This cop came up to my window and said, excuse me, sir, do you know why I pulled you over? And I rolled down the window further and I said, it's a lady. <laughs> So much of my femininity and my identification as a woman comes from this lack of hair, and I can't find my femininity in my hair, so I have to find it in another place, you know? And so it's like the way I act, the way I relate to people, the way I have relationships, the way I um, talk, the way I dress, the way I think about the world, my strengths, my um, understanding and compassion and empathy, which I don't necessarily think need to even be feminine characteristics, but like that's what I think makes me who I am. And biologically, I am born a female and I identify as female. So it's like when I got to that place of acceptance about myself, then I felt less like I needed to wear like long dangly earrings or red lipstick with my bald head if I was going to wear like a white button down Oxford with um, jeans and sneakers. I've gotten to like a really good place with my lack of hair. Like I'm just kind of like, I don't need it. Like I wasn't supposed to have it. And um, I can take a shower really fast. <laughs> but if I were to like say to you, I have like 100% self acceptance, I would be lying. Like I don't. I was online at Whole Foods the other day and I was like waving at this woman and she was looking at me like she didn't recognize me and I was like, how many fucking bald people do you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, did you forget me? <laughs> I am so memorable. <laughs> Rachel, are you your baldness? I am not my baldness, but my baldness is a part of me and my baldness has made me who I am. I know that for a fact. Rachel Fleet is a filmmaker, producer, and owner of 65 Turbans. She spoke with BuzzFeed's Eleanor Kagan. And this is another installment of Lena's Corner, where we highlight important feminist historical figures. Alice Coachman was fast, really fast. But growing up black in the heart of the segregated South through the 20s and 30s meant she couldn't use any athletic facilities. So instead, Alice crafted homemade jumps and ran on the dirt roads near her home, barefoot. With the encouragement of her fifth grade teacher, she honed her athletic abilities, which led to high school and college scholarships. Competing barefoot, Alice broke collegiate and national records. She won 10 high jump championships in a row and took home medals in numerous running events. Did I mention she also played college basketball? During the years she was at her athletic peak, the Olympics were canceled because of World War II. When they resumed in London in 1948, she left a record-breaking five feet six inches in the high jump finals, becoming the first black female gold medalist and the only American woman to win a gold medal that year. King George VI, father of current Queen Elizabeth, presented her award. After the jump, Alice wasn't even sure she'd won gold. I was on my way to receive the medal and I saw my name on the board, she later said. And of course I glanced over into the stands where my coach was and she was clapping her hands. You know how blind people see the world as by touch or by um, hearing? I do everything with my vagina. (laughs) (laughs) That's the amazing gynecological nurse practitioner, Lola Pellegrino. Everything has happened down there. So I've had an abortion. I've had chlamydia. I've had like all these things. And my career choice at least started because I just wanted to find out what was going on with myself. And then over time, I talked to other people about it and I realized I could just talk about it forever and it was infinitely interesting to me. I asked Lola a whole lot of questions about vaginas, ovaries, and how you know if your hormones have been partying too hard at the Chateau Marmont. If you want to hear that, check back Sunday for our bonus episode. If you had told me in eighth grade the kind of commentary my body would engender, I don't know what I would have done. Pursued anorexia, become a gymnast, killed myself. But guess what? It's not so bad. Because the weird thing is, I love my body. I really do. That's weird for a few reasons. 
One is that our society is sending me a lot of signals that it's not the kind of body that men, or even a jury of my female peers, find attractive. Writers use phrases from chubby to pulchritudinously, though sloppily, showing off her curves. Thank you, New York Times, for hiding your judgment behind a veil of SAT words that absolutely no one knows actually just mean fat. It's also weird because a big part of my job has been making jokes about my body and showing its secret parts to millions of people in a less than flattering light. So you wouldn't be insane to assume I'm driven by some ancient demons. But I'm not. I mean, no more remarkable demons than the one that lives inside of every modern woman, chastising her for enjoying a simple almond croissant. But I can make jokes about my body, show her off at her least glamorous. And you know why? Because it's my body. I know her. I love her. It's a real nobody talks shit about my mother but me type of situation. I love my tiny breasts and my puffy nipples. I love my pot belly, which I often rub when I'm falling asleep like it's a genie's lamp. I love my wide pale thighs and my dimpled knees, and I even love the way my ass spreads over the toilet seat. I just do. I fall asleep in this body. I wake up in this body. I live the life of my dreams in this body. What choice do I have? And if I could blink and have a different body, I wouldn't because this is the body I love. I hate it when I make a self-effacing joke about my body and someone goes, aw, or no way, you're gorgeous. It's like, thanks guys, but I know. And I can make the joke and still feel the love, just the way I do about my boyfriend every time he goes to a formal party in shower shoes. It's nice to tease the people and things we adore. It shows we know them. It gives them value. It makes them ours. This podcast was produced by Jenna Weiss Berman with help from Liz Watson and the All Lady BuzzFeed Pod Squad. Eleanor Kagan, Erica Kramer, Meg Kramer, and Julia Furlan. We had writing help from Alex Ronan. Our music is by Andrew Dost, and our theme song was written just for the show by the amazing band That Dog. Andrew Dost also helped with that. The song is called I Say What I Mean, and it's now available on iTunes. Emotional support provided by Liz Watson, who couldn't find me a blanket, so she put three sweatshirts on me and let me nap. And by Forrest Wickman, who didn't complain when Eleanor spent weeks locked in a room with Jenna, helping write this very script, and only communicated with him in Hamilton lyrics and dog gifts. Check out BuzzFeed's other podcasts, Another Round, Internet Explorer, and Rerun. And if you like the show, please subscribe and rate it on iTunes. It really helps get the womanly word out. Keep me from playing the romantic lead in some kind of like traditional rom com. But at the same time, guess what? I don't want to fucking do a rom com. So who fucking cares? Ooh, can I cuss on this? I'm being bad. <laughs> I remember once when I was in Chicago, I was performing and I was doing this very small show. And afterwards, a woman came up to me from the crowd and she was like a bigger gal. And she was like, you are so beautiful. Do not let the producers tell you you ever have to change. Just don't let the producers. And I was like, oh, my God, who are these terrifying mystery producers who are like, you've got to lose the weight, bitch. Um, but it's never happened. You know, like I never have had a producer pull me aside and tell me like, Ooh, we need to slim you down or something. And it's probably good because if they did, I would immediately just like headbutt them. So it's not a bad thing for me to be who I am. <laughs> it's actually a good thing. Aidy Bryant is a friend who turns my heart into sweet tarts and glitter. See her on SNL, this coming season of Girls, and wherever there is a dog with a smashed in face. And let's just say you do not want to be on the receiving end of an Aidy Bryant headbutt. Hair is so much more than just that weird string of cellular matter that sits atop our heads and covers up our crotches. Our relationship to our hair is a lifelong, ever-changing journey of identity. And assumptions, bad advice, frustration, like being constantly told we're supposed to tame our frizz. 
if the sun ever catches the back of your head and you have frizz, there is nothing more beautiful in this world. I cannot imagine something prettier than just like a lit halo of like, like strands in dialogue around someone's brain. It just like looks like your actual thoughts like floating around your head. It's so amazing. So if you tame your frizz, like that's just never gonna be possible, that shot. That's the writer Catherine Bernard who only has great things to say. BuzzFeed producer Eleanor Kagan invited some people into the studio to share their hair journeys, and she asked the timeless question, are we our hair? Let's begin with Hannah. My name is Hannah Georges. My hair is about a bit past, like, shoulder length. Super tightly curled, very kinky, very, very thick. When I have my afro out, everybody has something to say. Like, everything from, like, I'm going to make, like, a smart remark about, like, Angela Davis or like I'm gonna you know like those kinds of remarks or like how did you get it that way I'm like I'm black (laughs) it's like that's all I washed it (laughs) I let it dry (laughs) um combed it you know um to like how do you wash it like all these sorts of things that are like often benign but just exhausting I went to school in New Hampshire and I went to where there are just not a lot of black people went to a grocery store um, with some friends and a young black girl I'll never forget this a like six year old maybe young black girl kind of ran up to me and pulled on her um, her aunt's sweater and she said auntie um, her hair looks like mine and it was one of those things where I was like oh my god this little girl does not see people with natural hair ever she lives in New Hampshire her family is you know she's in an adoptive family like she just doesn't have this representation and it's like actually very meaningful and so you know I had a conversation with her aunt about what it means and like how to help her take care of it and all these things because I, I didn't grow up seeing like natural haired women as a little girl um, and so I didn't really think about what it looked like to be like old and like professional or like older and like stylish or all these things um, in a way that like I think that young girls have a little bit more access to now but it still feels important and I think the flip side of that is reminding myself that I am still also an individual human being that doesn't have to carry like the weight of representation and race at all moments Um, but I do try to be intentional about that when I can. The best feeling actually is when you like see another woman with natural hair and you like look at her hair and then you look at her and you're like, am I going to compliment her? And then you open your mouth to compliment her. And at the exact same time, she opens her mouth to say she likes your hair. And there, there's a way that like other natural hair, other black women validate each other that like nobody else can do. It's like I like I know that twist out took a long time. You know, I know that like you're you're there's like four Shea Moisture products in there, but whatever you're doing, it's working. And I see you. That feeling is like top 10 like black girl feelings of all time. Like I saw a group. Um, <laughs> I walked past a group of maybe, like, 10 black women with, like, natural hair and, like, braids and, like, afros and, like, just, like, beautiful hair. And I walked past and I was literally, like, my eyes, like, lit up. I was so excited. I walked past them. I was like, oh, my God, you guys are beautiful. Like, something. Um, And so I complimented them and walked past. And they were all taking a picture. And they were like, wait, wait, no, no, come back. Like, get in the picture. (laughs) And so I was just in this picture on 34th Street. And I have no idea where that picture went. But it was just that, like... I don't know. It feels almost ethereal. Um, it feels like there's something that we're that we're sharing here that I don't know how to communicate to other people in in a way that quite expresses it. So, you have India Ari who says I am not my hair. You have Lady Gaga who says I am my hair. Hana, yes. Are you your hair? Yeah, I think I'm my hair. My hair is also part of the reason that I became politicized around blackness in the certain ways that I have, um, and so. I think that I grab like I think that I gravitated toward understandings of like visual and like phenotypic blackness in the in the US partly because my hair is super tightly curled. Being invested in like black liberation struggles and blackness is something that's super central to how I think of myself and so I think for better or for worse I am my hair. Um my hair is like dynamic and shifting and does what it wants and also what I want it to. Um and so it feels like a fair thing to say. (laughs) Hannah Georges is a writer who covers the intersection of pop culture, race, class, and gender. We are here at Women of the Hour. We're talking to musician Mindy Lind, who... Hi, Mindy. Hi. Mindy sings and plays piano with the band Inley. She's coming at us from Seattle, and I actually first met Mindy when I was on my book tour for Not That Kind of Girl, and we had 
people submit videos as opening talent and Mindy submitted a video of herself singing and it fucking rocked my world. She has a haunting voice and an incredible mind. And then there's also a detail about Mindy, which is that she has no legs and rides around on a skateboard. (laughs) I identify as being a crip. I sometimes refer to those characterizations as crip culture. That particular phrase, crip, that's short for cripple. Yeah. You've told me before that that's an identity that kind of challenges the notion of disability, one that can mean edgy and complex and sexual and creative. So I want to start by asking you about that. How does your identity within crip culture intersect with your creative expression as a musician? For me, disability has always sort of been seen as a kind of a lack coming at me that like sort of I don't have any legs. But identity wise, I've sort of experienced disability or crip life as opportunity as that this world wasn't made for me. So I get to adapt to it. And that is a creative act every single day. So it came time for me to start making music. It was coming out of that, not necessarily directly in that I like seeing about having no legs <laughs> as much as that I've always um, been an adapting person, a really creative person, and that's come directly out of living in a world that really wasn't set up for me. You were born with no legs, right? Yes. There's never been a different way for you of experiencing the world. Right. Except for that time when I was younger and they tried to make me wear prosthetics. (laughs) I was totally in it for the Mary Janes. (laughs) That's amazing. And then I tried them on and I was like, these are awful and they don't feel good. And, you know, I don't really feel like myself. And it's really cool to see at the tops of the counters. And like I got to go roller skating one time, but... Uh, Other than that, I was super over it really quickly. You just wanted to have some clueless shoes, and after that, you were done. That's exactly (laughs) right. That's exactly right. I liked going into the shoe store, too, and being (laughs) with my brother, and we didn't have the legs at the time. And I remember, like, let's go shopping. Like, they're going to be here soon. And it's like, mm, no. I was thinking that there would probably be a lot of men, particularly, who, like, fetishized it and talked to you in a grotesque way. Like, I wonder what kind of influence it has on, like, dating, particularly the beginning, particularly meeting people. Like, is that a real test, how people react and how they engage? For sure. And it's funny that you said at the beginning, because I actually think that that's really the the charm piece right there is that like when and I say men because I'm like, you know, I date men. So I think when men usually meet me, they are really excited by their attraction to me. That part of it's really exciting to me, too. You know, like you're really I see that I see that newness, that excitement. And I I super duper get off on it. And then in a a lot of ways, it can be super confusing because what's the difference between that and like, you know, real attraction and the real complexities of dating. You don't want to feel like a fetish object for someone. Right. Or and when I do, because I think it's part of that energy can be really powerful. I want to know that like when the excitement wears off that like I'm still interesting and that we get to still date and spend time together. So yeah, that it goes beyond that, I think is the really confusing part. Most of the people listening to this podcast, I'm going to guess, are going to be radical women who care about like advancing causes of identity. Hopefully there'll be a couple Mm. 65 year old male weirdos in there too. (laughs) But I wonder if there's something you want to say to those people. Like if there's a way that Like, we can be supportive, engaged, down for the cause, without fetishizing it. Like, what do you you want from us? Well, I mean, I think that disability rights right now really looks like disability justice. It's such a wide-reaching section of the population covering all cultures. So it's not really a question of if we're going to show up. It's really more like when. So to think of more culturally integrative ways that we can include folks with disabilities so that when we show up, and this goes beyond bathroom stalls, beyond all that ADA stuff, it's like, actually, when I get into a bathroom and I'm with my friends at a bar, I'd really like to be able to check my eyeliner in the bathroom mirror. And I feel like that's not something that folks are going to think about unless they spend some time with me. And so because you can't really disregard people whose stories you know, I think that's what we can do right now is to be sharing more stories. To be, And I think that people are eager about them. Every single time I go outside, people are eager to know about me. Yeah. So to be inclusive of that is the best we can do right now for sure. And that's also because you're the most charming living person in the world. That's another That's another <laughs> aspect. <laughs> We're going to play some of your music, and there's a beautiful song that you sent me that you wrote recently, and I wondered if you wanted to give it a little intro. 
Okay, well, this song, um, I just did a lot of thinking of sort of like life as a life as a woman and what it is to be a girl. And I noticed I do spend some of my time being a recluse and a little bit of a reckless. So, uh, so this is what that song is about. And I hope you guys like it. Keeping. Amazing Mindy Lind for writing that song just for this show. Are you ready for some advice from June Squibb and Emma Stone? Ooh. <laughs> Good question. Two women who, despite an age difference of almost 60 years, are on the same page sass wise. No one is going to fuck with June Squibb. They don't. Remember the theme this week is our relationships to our bodies. We asked BuzzFeed readers to send their questions, and send them they did. How do I feel more confident without makeup on? Well, when I first started wearing makeup, I put it pretty much all over my face in thick layers. And that's how I felt good. And then now, well, Lena can see me. I'm wearing, a, I'm still wearing my makeup. And we got to get them and going into the shoe <laughs> store without legs. And be like, do you have my size? You strike me as a really political person. You're so clearly a feminist and you have a set of ideals that you're fighting for. How does your sort of feminism and your crip life, as you call it, how do those things intersect for you and what do they mean in relation to each other? Both roles are things that I find the um, this like sort of power and oppression from, you know, I treat them with a boldness. I really don't tend to want to act like these traditional roles of what it is to be a woman nor a traditional role of what it is to like be a person who uses a wheelchair. I'm really resistant to both of those. And then there's this other tricky stuff like the sort of cliches of uh, being a woman without legs, I think one of those would be that I'm really, really strong. (laughs) And uh, while I want to be resistant to that and feel feminine or, you know, whatever, I think that there's probably truth to every stereotype, as they say, and uh, that I have sort of claimed some of that strength for my own. Well, it's really amazing when we were in Seattle and we and you you know, opened the the reading I was doing that night and you came on stage with your skateboard and it was like, for a moment, that's what rocked people. And then you got behind the piano and that's what rocked people. And seeing you mm. be so in control of your own representation, mm-hmm. I think gave everybody full body chills because you were the owner completely of your own image. And I had kind of never seen a woman take that kind of ownership and kind of almost manipulate this space around her in that way. And it was really mind blowing. I love that. I feel like you just named it. That's so good. <laughs> and I want to know, I mean, here's the thing is like, yes, you live in Seattle. You're surrounded by liberal people. There's so much respect for your music. But you must also get a lot of really stupid fucking questions. And I wonder mm-hmm. whether you have to do a lot of educating on a daily basis. And does that get tiring? Yeah, I mean, on a good day when I feel well supported and really engaged and not isolated and like my hair looks fabulous. It's my power. It is a real kind of like what you were just describing, a real crip confidence that is like unique and special and I don't have to dye my hair a weird color. Like I am kind of weird and interesting and I get off on it. And then on a bad day when I don't feel so well supported and um, I'm just not doing so good I can tend to feel like a clown and I really fucking hate it so I think it depends on what day it is or how I'm feeling or what sort of reaction I'm getting I'd say though in general I um you know I get the most fascinating questions from kids and I tend to answer them really practically because I don't want to make myself extraterrestrial to them so some examples of questions from kids are like they're all very practical. They're like, if you don't have any legs, then how do you even brush your teeth? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then with the adults, and this is why I'm sort of so up on crip culture, so up on images in the media, because I, I feel like I know what images are being portrayed based on the responses that get thrown at me. These what I call crip cat calls, which get said to me basically every time I go outside. So they can really vary from like, 
the other day when I went into one of those really awesome legal weed stores here in Seattle and I was on a skateboard and I come in and the woman who's like there to greet you is like oh, really traumatized by my impairment. And she was like, oh, my God, are you OK? Are you hurt? Like really traumatized. And I get angry. I get really angry. Like and what I really w- want to do is be sarcastic and annoying like. I just lost my legs in the parking lot (laughs) and it's a bloody mess out there and I need your help. You know, like I want to be like, yeah, that's what hurt looks like versus like, I'm just coming in here and I'm shorter than you. There's no trauma around that. And then some really funny stuff like that one time I went to a bar and this guy came up to me all suave and cool and was all like, I don't really care that you have no legs. I totally want to finger fuck you in the bathroom right now. (laughs) Stuff like that where people like think they're saying the right edgy thing. Here's a small sampling of some of the body commentary I receive on a day-to-day basis via the World Wide Web. She looks like a warthog to me. Hashtag truth. Lena Dunham. Hence her last name equals Dun Ham equals cooked pig. Lena Dunham looks like the type of person who likes to fart in her hand and smell it. I want Lena Dunham's fat ass dead. Lena Dunham looks like a toe. Disgusting, quivering mass of horror is the best description of Lena Dunham I've ever heard. Lena Dunham does have a horrible body. Hate it every time she had her ugly, naked ass body on girls. Hashtag Lena Dunham, Jesus Christ, what a fat, ugly bitch, black. Those last few tweets actually just came from this morning, before I even woke up. And one of the ones I didn't read you actually caused me to contact a highly paid security professional. So, congratulations to me. <laughs> are you pleased? So one of the worst things I was like, are these bad enough? I'm sorry, no, I, I loved it. I didn't mind. It was my idea. It may seem odd to say that reading these tweets doesn't really hurt me, but it doesn't. I view it more as an anthropological study, less about one woman, me, and more about women, us. I know that these aren't healthy to read. I know that they're not expanding my mind. That's why I don't check my own Twitter anymore. But when I have to look at them, I feel this kind of hollow, empty curiosity. That being said, some of these details are so creative and so observant that they can't help but impress you. I mean, I do look like a toe. I've had so much more than a good time. It's meant so much more to me. But I don't know if I'll ever fit inside who you want me to be. Welcome to Women of the Hour. I'm Lena Dunham, and I am a delicate flower. Today we're going to be talking about bodies, our relationships to our bodies as women. And let's start with something a little more uplifting than the tweets that I got today. I'm A.D. Bryant, and I'm a full-blown size bitch. (laughs) Lena and I, recently on a trip together, were sharing a steak as a snack, basically. And we were talking about how, like, it's probably insane to have, like, a steak for a snack, but that is cool, that's who we are, snack steak. We were talking about what it's like to kind of, um navigate like the Hollywood systems, ew, who am I to say Hollywood systems, but like kind of, you know, show business and not be like a tiny little teeny little teensy feather woman. And just kind of what our experience is for like addressing for events. And I was telling her that basically I sometimes call myself a size bitch, which basically (laughs) to me means sorry to be a bitch, but I'm not going to apologize for my size, you know, and that I'm not, uh, I'm not wrong for having the body that I do. I still deserve to be dressed cool or I still deserve to feel as glamorous or as uh, Hollywood cool as anyone else. It's interesting because I feel like a lot of times when I'm like reading scripts or something that maybe someone sent to me and they're like, we're thinking of you for this. It ends up being like kind of like a low status, nervous, kind of like hungry woman. (laughs) Which, I get it. That is kind of what I am. I mean, not that I'm low status, but I'm a nervous, hungry woman. And so, yes, that's a type that I can play. And so I wonder sometimes if there is sort of like a pigeonhole that you're sort of, people try to like kind of put you in just because 
you have some quality of otherness. In a lot of ways, I think of my otherness as like my greatest strength. It's what makes, makes me different. It's part of the reason I can play a lot of the roles that I get to play. But of course, it, it has its like, you know, its other sides where maybe it does 